Good morning and welcome to this exciting Native American Pottery Channel discussion hosted by Greenlee Art Space. I'm Cheyenne Grandi, a volunteer and the art therapy liaison on Greenlee Art Space's board of directors. We are a 501c3 nonprofit gallery dedicated to providing space for creativity, contemplation, and community. Greenlee Art Space relies on patrons volunteers and donations to operate and facilitate community-based arts programs like this. You can donate or find out more at our website, greenleyartspace.org. We are proud to announce that we were awarded the prestigious Alliance for California Traditional Arts Living Cultures Grant for our project, Native American Artists, Traditional, Contemporary, and Beyond. We are thrilled to work again with Nesh Kanukat, a Native American Artist Collective. We want to thank ACTA for this grant and Nesh Kanukat for the opportunity to collaborate. Today's panel will feature introductions from four artists describing how their heritage impacts their art making process. Following the videos, we will move into the panel discussion portion, which will be facilitated by Kat Hai. After today's program, you can look forward to more panel discussions in this series featuring artists in beadwork, gourds, basketry, and storytelling. A culminating art exhibit will open January 22nd, 2022 at Greenlee and feature work from all the artists in this series. Now, before we get started, there's just a bit of housekeeping. This panel discussion will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel. So if you don't wish for your image to be recorded, you may turn your video camera off. Please keep yourselves muted throughout the discussion, and there will be time for questions at the end. So go ahead and put any questions you might have into the chat. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to kick things off with an introduction by our first artist, Rowan Harrison. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for, uh, thank you, Kimberly and Greenlee Art Space for coordinating and putting together this panel discussion on the art of pottery making amongst Indigenous people. Um, my name is Rowan Harrison. I am Pueblo of Isleta on my mom's side. Uh, we are the Tiwa speaking people. Um, our reservation is located about 12 miles south of Albuquerque, New Mexico, the land of enchantment. Um, my dad's side, I am Navajo. Um, we refer to ourselves as the Diné. And my dad comes from a small little town in the northwestern part of New Mexico called Shiprock, over there in the Four Corners region there. Um, I've been practicing the art of hand-built, hand-coiled, hand-painted pottery making for a good 20 plus years now. Um, my journey began uh, with my grandmother on the Pueblo Vizleta. I was born in Albuquerque, New Mexico, but raised here in Southern California. Um, so during my childhood, um, I would spend some summers with my grandmother, sometimes a week, sometimes two weeks, maybe even as long as a month. And during that period of time, um, my grandmother um, introduced me into working with clay. So my grandmother, you know, would go to her shed and she would bring out a bag of um, natural clay and she would bring it to into her kitchen. And it was there that she taught me and my cousin um, how to make, um, pinch pot forms and little animal forms out of clay. And so that's where my journey began in the ceramic arts. Uh, so, and as when I be, in my adult years is when I really started taking the art form more seriously. Um, I'm located here in Orange County. So um, a lot of what I do is um, a lot of the materials I use are commercial materials. So I do hand built hand coil pottery and all the work I do is all handmade and it's all hand painted. Um, I've been going, been going through this transition lately of trying to work more in a traditional way, um, 
in my journeys to New Mexico recently in the past couple of years, sometimes I will go out and collect material um, like clay and um, in New Mexico, Arizona, and also here in, in different areas of Southern California. So I'm kind of going through this transition of working in a more traditional way and um, processing my own clays. Um, I teach pottery at the Muckenthaler Cultural Center, which is a nonprofit cultural center in Fullerton. Um, I do a lot of programming with the Los Angeles County Public Library System and with the National Park Service in Ventura. Um, so, um, and I do a lot of different art shows here in Southern California and abroad. Um, yeah, so that's my intro. <laughs> Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Ana Gloria, aka Marta. I'm from San Jose de la Sorra, a community in, uh, in Baja, California. And uh, I learned making uh, pottery with my with my mom, my grandma, and my great grandma. And then uh, I just, you know, going when I was a little girl, going up to the mountains, collecting the clay and then grind it. And, you know, do the whole process. And then, um, uh, so yeah, so that's how I learned doing the pottery, but also with the ladies from uh, Santa Catarina, they are like Oax, Kumiai, and Pai Pai. So, you know, I was going to events with them, you know, when I was a little girl, I was learning from the elders. So it was, uh, I was very good to, to spend time with them and learn. And then, and also, you know, like, because we go, used to travel a lot with different events with the Cocoa Pot too. So learn how to do bit work with them. So with the pottery, um, we uh, traditional, Kumei traditional, we use uh, the red ochre to put the signs on the pottery. So it's not, not, not too many people are doing that. So I'm like trying to incorporate this now. So, you know, people uh, start doing more pottery with the signs with the, using the red ochre and stuff like that. I think it's important to bring it back that tradition. And then, uh, so yeah, that's how um, I always like to teach, you know, so the tradition keep alive and, you know, more people will learn. Yeah, this, um, uh, this like, a, I call the little mushroom. <laughs> that one, uh, that's when you're building your pottery, you put it in the inside and then with the stick, you know, you, you, you hit in the, 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 the outside. And, that's like, and then that's what take all the air out and then help to form the pot up, going up like that. So it's just a tool for uh, pottery making. Well, yeah, the design is just represent different, um, you know, kind of like a storytelling, you know, sometimes it's like mountains or represent the stars. And then we have uh, designs that we for thousands of years that sometimes we like to incorporate in the pottery. So, uh, so they have a story, you know, to tell. And then, um, so like some of the signs are like very, like, it's you know, like very unique for thousands of years. And a lot of like, um, represent, like I say, you know, like the cosmology and, you know, animals and stuff like that. It depends on every design, you know, what you want to tell the people. And I think, you know, it's important to, to, to have new stories too, you know, because we're still alive. And then, uh, so that's why it's so important to any design we do, you know, now like we need to like write it down. So next generation, they will know about the designs. And then, uh, so, you know, cause some people like think like, when they see the signs, they're like, oh, they think they represent this, but no, whoever is the artist, you know, it's time to tell the story. So it's important to have that, write it down too, so people can learn from that. So not guessing, you know what I mean? <laughs> so. Some of the pottery is, uh, we use it for different, you know, like for different ceremonies and stuff like that, like cooking and uh, also to to put like, you know, like, um, yeah, for different ceremonies. We have like the wedding pot, they call it, it's like two opens. And then we have like plates and spoons and stuff like that. So we have different kinds of pottery for different, um, for different things and then um and also some people do like uh go rattles with the clay 
and we use different clay. We use the red mountain clay and also the desert clay. So it will be different colors for the pottery. And then uh, the traditional way to, to burn it, you know, it's in the underground. And then we just leave it there overnight. And then that's why like every pot will be unique because the, the fire will make the designs on it. And then, uh, and that's what I'm saying, you know, that's um, so just beautiful. Thank you. Hello, my name is Marie Cheatham. I am from Oklahoma. My mother was Muskogee Creek, born in Willica, Oklahoma. My father was Charles Pershing Hatcher, born in Wetumpka, Oklahoma. He was Choctaw. And uh, he was killed in World War II when I was just an infant. So my mother was this 15-year-old girl with an infant. And she very quickly realized that she had to leave her family situation, which wasn't so good. And uh, she wanted to be part of the mainstream of American society, which meant that she had to get married because, you know, in the 40s, people were looked down upon if you had a child and didn't have a husband. And uh, so we married. We married seven times before I was 12. I had to take the last name and we moved every time. So uh, mother was always very proud of her heritage, but she realized that she had to get a job and go to work and people weren't hiring Indians in those days. So she told everybody she was Italian. <laughs> she was dark skin, dark hair, black eyes. And uh, so I, she took me out of the culture and I did not get to be raised with my culture. Truth to tell, she had very little culture to pass on anyway. Well, that never worked because blood will out. And the less heritage I had, the more I wanted it. So I was always, all of my life, an artist in search of identity. And uh, I was doing things that were traditional and didn't know it as a girl. I was digging the clay out of the creek beds and making my doll's dishes and putting them in the sun to dry. And now I just use a kiln. And I was weaving baskets, you know, to carry around my little toys in. Well, that's a very old tradition with the Muskogee Creek. They took the local clay, stamped designs in it, and they made beautiful utilitarian baskets and pots. So I was really, you know, <laughs> I, blood will out. So moving around all the time and trying to fit in, that's the best, best kind of teacher to be an actress. You have to survive. And necessity, as we all know, is the best teacher in the world and best motivator. And also it was the best training for me professionally and in my artistic life because I moved around uh, looking for different influences. Now, I had grown up listening to this wonderful legend of Quanah Parker, the last great Comanche leader on the plains, and his mother, who was white, she was a white girl, kidnapped and taken into Comanche society and taken into family, very much as I was later on. So I thought, well, you know, I got a little money from acting, so I'll go down to Oklahoma, introduce myself, and try to get some research done on Quona Parker, maybe make a project out of it. Well, they made a project out of me. I volunteered to be Cynthia Ann Parker in outdoor pageants, which I performed with them for several years, and I was gifted the most beautiful buckskin regalia. It is so lovely. And I've recently donated that buckskin regalia to the Autry Museum. And you can see later on how it influenced my work. I also uh, studied with Beatrice Wood at, um, in Ojai. And then I found Idlewild. And I worked with Juan Quesada from Mexico. He dug his own clay and he cut his, his wife's hair to make the thin line brushes. And the Lu uh, Lucy Lewis's daughters, Emma and Dolores, I've worked with from Acoma. And uh, then I have a wonderful picture of Juan and his wife, Gia Casada, with Lucy Lewis, very rare picture. And Elizabeth Mojado from the Savoba Cahuilla basketry. I worked with Donna Largo, her student, Vera Ryerson, who's a Yurok basket teacher. My baskets were Yurok and Cahuilla. I worked with uh, Susana and Mar uh, Mariano Valadez, the Huichol 
down in Mexico, Barbara Drake, who's Tongva. We wove rabbit skin capes with her. Uh, Lori Sisquap, Mountain Cahuilla, Fort Sill Apache, Basketry. I worked with Catherine Siva Sobel, eating the wild, learning about the plants. Michael Cabote, Hopi, Michael Horse, Yaki, and Mescalero, Zuni for ledger painting. All of these people have encouraged me and influenced me. And I, I live in a huge community of my heritage now. Hello, my name is Karina King. My tribal heritage is Hoopa, Yurok, and Cherokee. Uh, my artwork focuses mostly on my Northern California native heritage, which is the Hoopa and Yurok tribes. Uh, my art is using traditional patterns in a very non-traditional medium. So I work with what's called fused glass. And fused glass is layers of glass that I fuse into one solid piece of glass in a kiln. So I start with sheets of glass. So these are just single sheets of glass and the sheets are actually 20 by 36. So this is an already cut piece. And in those, I cut up pieces as you can see on the back of this platter. And then I layer it with our tribal designs and put three or four layers of glass together into a kiln so it fuses into one solid piece. I do that at about 1500 degrees and I have to wait for that to cool down enough so it's not molten glass and put it into a mold to give it shape. So that's how I make my fused glass pieces. And I am doing, but like I say, very non-traditional uh, medium. There's not many Native American glass artists and there's very few Native American fused glass artists, but I am incorporating very, very traditional designs in my fused glass. So I really enjoy mixing both our ancient, I mean, our baskets are very ancient. Um, so ancient designs into a very contemporary medium. And I really enjoy sharing our basket designs with all different tribes at powwows and art fairs. Um, and I've done them all up and down California. And now I'm starting to go out into other, other states. And uh, I make glass and also my mom makes glass. And we do this in two separate studios. So my mom is still up in Eureka, up in Northern California, where I was born. And I am down in Livermore near the Bay Area. So I originally learned how to do stained glass when I was a teenager. And my mom was doing jewelry and silversmithing. And she decided to get into torch glass which is using a torch and making glass beads. And then to do that, you have to use a kiln also in that process. So my mom was the one who learned about fused glass. And then my mom was the one who really wanted to try and incorporate our tribe's basket designs into the glass. But she was trying to do the designs with tape and X-Acto knives. So I have an engineering background. I used to teach people how to use lasers and CNC machines. So I introduced my mom to a vinyl cutter. So then she and I have worked for a while to get the designs into the computer. And then using the powdered glass for the designs and the stencils, that's how we get such sharp designs on the glass. So it's been a collaboration between she and I. And uh, she, she started focusing on fused glass about six years ago. And then I joined her about four years ago. So we both have a very artistic background, just in different ways. And we've come together and we make these uh, now, uh, like I say, all over, all over the California and then into other states.
Hi, I'm Kat Hai. Um, I'm coming to you as the, what we call the whip woman of Neshkinukit. Neshkinukit is our loose network of native artists, um, more or less in California. Um, we got together uh, actually initially at the beginning of uh, 2020, I mean 2000, um, with L. Frank Manriquez and Janine Antoine and other artists who started with the California Arts Council grant to bring us together in California. And we've been keeping on with the tradition and trying to uh, support one another and do group shows because we feel that that seeing more of us together gives people a better understanding of Native artists and art. So um, we're honored to have this grant from ACTA and I'm coming to you from my garden, as you can see, which is in Topanga Canyon. And it's the traditional uh, homeland of the Gabriel Tongva people and of the Shumash. It's kind of the interface between the two. And we really appreciate uh, interfacing with each other and learning from each other. So I think I'm going to go to the questions and our panel. And uh, the first question that we come up with is, uh, uh, is this a traditional art form for your tribe? And most of the artists have answered that. Um, um, Gail, I mean, uh, Marie, oh, I see Gail. Uh, can you tell me more about your pottery traditions? Unmute, unmute, please. I didn't know I did that. Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> unmute myself. Good. Okay. Well, as I had very little uh, traditional training, um, but I had all I've always made things out of clay. Uh, it's actually my sanity saver. I have worked for 65 years as an actress, and that can be very strange. So <laughs> to settle down and get back into nature, I dig in the ground. I, uh, I, I put my hands in clay and you can't be out of, uh, out of center in your soul. You cannot center a piece of clay on the wheel if you're not centered um, psychically and emotionally, I think. So um, I have a series of, of pieces that are, I call blood will out. And one of them is uh, a, a the, a mask, a ghost mask that, that will be in this exhibit. And I was using red clay. And if we can put that picture up of the mask, I can speak about it. Uh, it has uh, traditional designs on it. Um, it's, the, it's the mask. <laughs> That's it. Okay, I made this mask out of red clay and I put white... Um, slip over it and then I brushed away the white slip to show the red clay coming through which it meant to me the longer you live or as much as time as you spend in the white culture your blood will out red will out you know uh, I always go outside to pray just like my mother did and uh, I pray differently now than when I was taught by the by all those people who taught me um, this and then I, I put uh, uh, the tribal uh, directional markings, red, yellow, and black for the directional markings. And then I glazed it with a clear glaze. Well, the interesting thing is, is it turned everything gray. That red clay then turned gray. And I thought, oh, that's very interesting. And then I embellished it with all of the uh, coils of fabric and the feathers and everything. And then I put milagros on it, the uh, silver prayers, metal prayers. Uh, they're actually tin, stamped tin. And you can see on the right, uh, left hand side, you can see a little head. You know, one man might be praying for to relieve his headache. 
Then you can see up there a little closer, there's a, a figure of an, a, a bull. Uh, are there, you can see all these milagros. Um, uh, they are um, prayers for arms or legs or anything. So I, that's, <laughs> and then I embellished it with the fish for food and all of the other things that are on it. And then I started by making teapots that look like ladies. And the first one I did was a Creek lady teapot. And after the conquest, uh, ladies had trade cloth to make their uh, garments out of. And they did that instead of using animal skins. And um, they would make beautiful uh, dresses and tops and embellish them with ribbons. And they, they always wore a white apron and embellished it with long ribbons. And she's wearing a dance crown also. Um, I made this in a tribute to my mother. And then uh, my regalia, my Comanche regalia, after I had um, uh, performed this service for the Comanche and I was given this regalia, it's buckskin. On the left-hand side, you'll see, you'll see the breastplate, that's all beaded. And then right underneath it to the left, you'll see the gathering bags. There's an awl bag and a knife bag and a little gathering bag. And then to the right of the figure, you'll see her dance bag. And then below you see her leggings. And then you'll see at the top, you see her dance crown and her uh, hair ties and this long fringe on the side of each of the arms. And when the ladies dance, this, this fringe sways very, very beautifully. It's very beautiful to see. Now I use this to make this pot and this is a storytelling pot. I use this, uh, the clay, uh, natural color of the clay. And um, you can see her breastplate in the middle and to the left, you see, well, you see her belt with the two long um, hanging portions, which ladies get when they come of age. And then you see her gathering bags. And on the right, you see her dance bag. And this is all symbol. I just thought it was, <laughs> I really fell in love with it. And then I was encouraged to make more of doll of no, teapot this is a functioning teapot you can actually make your tea in it and drink it i was encouraged to make more of them as a teaching uh, uh element so i did i branched out into our zuni teapots uh, these have a traditional you can see the ladies have traditional garb it's a, a, a woolen rectangle of cloth and they pin it over one shoulder and it comes underneath one arm. And in the winter time, you can see the ladies because it gets cold, uh, they wear a white shirt underneath. And then it's, it's belted at the waist and it has a, uh, a design down further, down further. And you look at their hair. Now, doesn't that look familiar? The maidens wear their hair in these big whirls on either side of their head. It reminds me of that character in Star Wars, and I think that's where they got that. So my teapot on the left uh, shows you the, uh, the black rectangle of cloth, and it's flapped over, and she's wearing a white shirt. And I've decorated her, um, her uh, necklace uh, of turquoise and, and uh, coral and I've painted platinum uh, on the nausea so that you can see that it looks like silver and she has a very long neck because she's listening she's listening to to the gossip and the, you know ladies gather and they bring their work with them and they call and they talk they talk they listen <laughs> and then another celebration of um, of the corn is the Zuni corn maiden teapot that I made. Now you can see on the left, these ladies are just fantastic. See, they're wearing the, uh, the black uh, rectangle uh, tied to one side and this beautiful uh, um, uh, jewelry, turquoise jewelry and everything. And they have pots on their heads. Now, corn is a symbol of 
prosperity. Corn is life for most Native American tribes and even the Huicho down in Mexico. And in the springtime when the, uh, the rain comes, we have the corn dance, the corn maiden dance. And they carry these pots to collect the rain so that they can water the corn in this very arid la uh, land where they live. So it's a celebration of the prosperity and hope for the future. Thank you, Marie. Um, I'm, I want to ask a question of Anna. Um, are you with us, Anna? Do we have Anna with us? Yes, hello. Oops. Hauka. 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 I have a I have a question for you, Anna. Uh -huh. I I have um I have you were talking about the the pottery used in ceremony, and uh -huh. I have this little character that uh -huh. was given to me by Gloria. Uh-huh. And can you tell me a story about what this is for and how it's used? Can you see it? Where am I? <laughs> oh. oh, no. No, I really don't. But um, the one we use for wedding ceremony is something like this. Ah, okay. This was a little figure. Yeah. But this is the, that's what I was talking about, the, the wedding. The, the wedding, wedding ceremony. Part. Uh huh. So this is for, for the women and the men, and then ah. uh, they, men, they do a special drink, and then um, that's part of the ceremony. And then, um, but they're a little bigger. So this is just an example of the wedding uh, ceremony. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I have I have another one of of uh, let's see. Uh, I think this is Teresa Castro's. Oh, uh -huh. beautiful. Um, can you tell me about the 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 fire uh, bursts on it and the firing process? So yeah, so every uh, pot is uh, unique because the fire will make the designs on it, and then uh, so we make a, a hole in the ground, and then we just put it in there, and then we use uh, yaka or they can use like uh, cow patties and other woods, and then um, so usually it's overnight. So the next day, you know, they will come out with uh, different different designs and different, you know, different colors and stuff. Right. And then they have a, a natural mica on the clay. So yeah. it's very, very beautiful. I say have gold. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful. Thank you, Anna. Rowan, um, I know there are stories to tell with the designs that you put into your pottery also. Can oh yeah, yeah. I mean, with with my work, um, if you look at my body of work, um, the design work you see there, a lot of the designs, the motifs, um, the patterns, um, a lot of them are traditional southwestern Pueblo elements within the work. Um, you know, a lot of these elements that you, that you see in my work, um, they're all related to what's in the natural world, what's in the Pueblo world, the native world. And when you come to the reservation, you know, there's, you know, the trees, the mountains, the birds, um, the plants, um, there's the rivers, there's the mesas, the plateaus, the clouds, um, all those elements, you know, are in the natural world. And so the patterns that you see in my work um, represents those um, natural, you know, those natural things that you see out of nature. So, you know, when you look at this double neck base here, um, the blue motif is raindrop. Um, how important is rain for the pe people of the Southwest? 
not, o- not only in modern contemporary times, but also going back thousands of years to our ancestors, the Anasazi people. So anything that's associated with rain, um, which obviously is clouds, um, rain clouds, thunder clouds, you know, all those, all that, all that, all those elements are very sacred and very special for our people because they provide, you know, rain, water. Um, I use a lot of dots in, in my work. Um, you know, the dots you see throughout my body work, not only do I use it as a decorative element, but the dots, um, I like to think of representing our ancestors who have moved on over the decades and over the hundreds and thousands of years. Um, so when when I'm in New Mexico and when I'm out on the reservation and it's a clear um, night, I mean, you look into the nighttime sky, you can see thousands and thousands of stars. And I like to think of the dots representing those stars and of course the stars representing our ancestors who are watching over us um, taking care of us blessing us as we go through our nighttime hours those are beautiful thank you rowan um, thank you <laughs> i know it's difficult you know for traditional potters to get their materials and and Anna, you've shared a little bit about where you get your materials. And and Rowan, you have some good stories about getting materials. And, and actually, Marie, you've gone and dug up the, the clay itself to make the pottery. Not materials you get at Michael's, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Anna, where do you go to get uh, your clay? I have different spots uh, to get the clay. Uh, usually in the reservation, we have a, you know, have a spot where to get it. But um, when I'm teaching classes in the college, I have um, a spot is safe. So I take all my students to go and uh, collect the clay. So, so they learn you know, collecting the clay and grinding it. I mean, the whole process. So I have several spots. They're safe for people to go not very close to the road and things like that. And I was making sure uh, everyone's safe. And I talk a little bit about, you know, you talked about grinding it and and it isn't just getting the wet clay and, and molding it, but there's a whole process of incorporating old uh, ground clay too, huh? Yes. Uh, so yeah, we have, um, like I said, you know, we have different kind of clays, you know, like the desert clay. Uh, I think I use most of the, the red clay. And then, um, so every semester, you know, we take the students to collect the clay and grind it. And then sometimes they build, you know, they, they make a pot and sometimes they are kind of like, uh, they broke or stuff like that. So that clay, they told them not to throw it away, but recline, uh, regrind it again. So you can use it for the new patch of uh, pottery. So that we use everything, so we don't waste any of the um, of the clay. Also, um, uh, we save it. You know, like we prepare the clay and then save it for another two or three days, and still working with the same clay. That's wonderful. Um, are are we opening it up to questions now, David? So up, up to you, Kat, we could, um, we could open it up to questions or we could do the little video. Do oh, let's do Corina's video. Yes. Oh, Rowan should you. do his, oh, sorry. I what? was thinking that Rowan should talk about his firing, pit firing. Oh, that's, that's right. We have a couple pictures from Rowan on a pit firing. I don't know if we want to bring those up first and then, oh, yeah. and then put in. Uh... Sure. Let's okay. have Rowan talk about that. Okay, so, um, you know, when I first started working in clay, um, of course, I work and reside in Fullerton, California. So, um, naturally, you know, my first inklings was to get commercial clay. It was most easily accessible. But, you know, throughout my journey, throughout my clay journey and my 
you know, working more with clay, um, I learned a little bit about micaceous clay, um, which is mica clay. And um, so mica clay is um, mined up in northern New Mexico. And with the mica clay, you know, I've talked to a lot of potterers about mica clay and a lot of potterers that I see that utilize this clay will do pit fires with this clay. So um, mica clay, you cannot get in Southern California, not that I'm aware of. So when I get it, I order it from New Mexico or Santa Fe. And when I start working with it in California, uh, there are periods of time where I will actually, um, when it comes to the firing process, most of my work is electric kiln fired, but there are some times when I take the mica pieces and I will do traditional pit firings using just basic wood. Um, this particular technique, I kind of like, I kind of took the example of one of our, one of the, one of our matriarchs in traditional Native American pottery, Maria Martinez. Um, I've watched her video on more than many, on more than several occasions. And I watched how she does her pit farms. And I kind of took that same process. So um, with the micaceous clay, I would go out and either, I would either go to Huntington Beach where they have firing or I, and then this um, picture in this image, this was done out in the desert in Antelope Valley. There's a campground out there that has a lot of firing. So, you know, the basic process is taking the pieces, um, putting them in a fire in a fire pit or a fire ring, um, covering them covering them up with like um, metal or some type or some type of material to protect them, and just stacking the wood around the perimeter of the pots and just lighting the wood. Uh, the wood is just basic um, scrap wood, you know, that you would find discarded wood um, I would use and, you know, just igniting the wood and then slowly, the, slowly um, raising the temperature of the heat is very important in this process. Um, you don't want to um, expose the pots to high heat at a quick, you know, very quickly or else the pots could burst. So it's kind of like a very slow process of, you know, slowly adding wood as the fire continues to burn and continue and continually adding wood. Um, it's a fun process. It's, you know, it's, it's very labor intensive, so I don't do it quite often, but the times I've done it, I've had, you know, pretty much, um, successful firings. Sometimes pots might break, they might crack, but when you have a good firing, um, you know, you have, especially with the mica clay, sometimes you'll get these subtle smoky looks on the surface of the mica clay. Uh, and sometimes they just come out this nice golden kind of brownish color to them. So, you know, traditional firings, I, I really enjoy doing it and I hope to do more of them in the future. Because again, it's all part of this traditional way of working with clay that goes back hundreds and thousands of years back to our ancestors, the Anasazi people. Thank right. you. Yeah, um, thanks, Rowan. Um, oh, sorry to interrupt you, Kat. I was just wondering, we have a question wondering where Anna teaches and if she could, we can show more examples of her work. So that's what I want to go to next, if we can. Let's go to Anna. Um, we're going to pull up some examples of your work, and if you could talk about them and um, where where it is that you teach. Yes, um, <clears throat> I teach at Kumiai Community College. Like every semester, we'll have different classes. Uh, well, lately we're not teaching because COVID, but um, I usually teach pottery on the on the summer, and then <clears throat> so some of the pottery I do. I try to incorporate the traditional painting and making the sign with uh, red ochre. Like for example, that picture that have a uh, red ochre on it. And then, uh, so 
other well, nobody really uh, using the the red ochre anymore. So I'm trying to bring them back, and then that's what I teach my uh, teach my students how to um, how to collect it and how to do the whole process. Uh, also, um, so there's several little ones. Um, I guess I teach every semester. So in, in every semester I teach different different classes. So um, that's an opportunity for me for the summer do pottery and fall do baskets. And spring I do uh, traditional kumiai uh, food. So every semester I do something different. And then, um, but yeah, I mean, I like to, I mean, I like to, to do all that kind of stuff. And then uh, of course, um, pottery is one of, one of my, favorite things to do and then um so yeah and also we do yuluri too i don't have any pictures i didn't send any picture but uh we do beads with um with clay and then <clears throat> they have some um some of the students are ready and some people over here in san diego they start doing um clay beads and doing jewelry with that and very beautiful work and uh and of course in uh in baja too they have, uh, they do a lot of like jewelry. Like for example, this, uh, thank you. this necklace, uh, this one is made by uh, Tirsa. I can't, I can't believe it's Tirsa. Tirsa Castro from Santa Catarina. So I have a lot of the work over here. And also we just opened a, um, a store. A store over here in, in San Diego in Old Town. Osai. Cos, uh, Cos, uh, Cosai Kumiai Market. And of course, we have a lot of the arts and craft uh, from Santa Catarina. And we have work from uh, uh, Tirsa, Gloria, Gloria, she's Kumiai, and Pai Pai. And, um, <clears throat> and we work from different, uh, thank you, from um, different artisans from, from both sides of the border. And then uh, <clears throat> like um, <clears throat> the picture behind me, this is, um, a painting made by Tom Ward from uh, Manzanita. So we're trying to have, you know, different work from different people over here. And also we have the space outside. Whoever want to like to do a demonstration, uh, welcome to come. How do you spell Kosai so that people can look up the store? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> K-O-S-A-Y, and then Kumia Market. We have a sticker over here. Thank you. <laughs> oh, it's kind of hard with the thing, but yeah. Yeah, we're right here in, in Old Town between, um, right in the main plaza. <laughs> Great. Um, are we going to go to, to Karina's piece or are there more questions? Yes, we'll do, we'll do Karina's piece. We don't have any more questions right now, but if anybody has questions, please put them in the chat. And we'll get to questions after Karina's piece, some more questions. So we're going to hear from Karina now um, since she couldn't join us live. So I'm currently sitting here in my studio and you may hear some clicking in the background. And that clicking is my kiln, which is currently at 1200 degrees. This, this is a mix of traditional and contemporary. Like I say, the designs are very, very traditional. Um, our baskets are made from very natural materials. Um, during COVID, I started learning how to do traditional basket work and uh, started gathering materials so I can practice more at it. So I, I am amazed at the patterns that our tribe has used is my background's engineering. And for me to do these designs, I sit there and I have to graph paper out the designs. And I think about these, the women who were doing this for hundreds of years, they had those designs in their head. And it, it just boggles my mind that women knew how to find the right materials, when to gather the materials, where to, how to weave them together, how to, know how many strands they needed to do to get the designs just right and these baskets were used every day so i am beyond amazed at the traditional form that we take these basket designs from so i'm hoping to honor my ancestors in using their designs 
in a very contemporary medium. So I've had people come up to me and ask if my designs are from Mexico. I've had people ask me if my designs are from the Southwest. I mean, I've had all kinds of different questions because nobody knows about Northern California. So in some of the art pieces in the presentation, I show um, we have a salmon piece and that salmon piece has a design called friendship within the salmon and then a design called sturgeon back on the outside of the salmon. Um, I also did a feather plate and that feather plate has the swallowtail design on it. Um, another piece I did was the gold bowl and on the outside of that gold bowl is what I know as frog hand and then on the inside is called crab foot. Um, I've always been attracted to glass. I like to say I learned how to do stained glass when I was a teenager and the first things that I ever made were actually beaded pieces and this was before I knew about the Yurok and Hoopa lineage in my family. So I feel like there's always been a pull towards glass. And then as far as it being a contemporary art form, I mean, a lot of people are fascinated by glass. Is you, the light that you get through glass is unlike any other medium. And it's, it has a mind of its own. So I work with glass daily to, to do these different pieces. And if I'm not in a good headspace, a lot of times I'll break the glass, I'll get cut by the glass. Um, glass lets you know when you should and should not work with it. And part of our traditional teachings is that if you are a maker of things for other people to use, you should make them in a good headspace because you are sharing your thoughts and your feelings with whoever receives these pieces. So glass keeps me honest <laughs> in a lot of ways, because like I say, it, it will literally cut me if I am not <laughs> in a good headspace. So that, that's what I keep in mind, mixing, like I say, traditional and contemporary. I try and honor, uh, honor my heritage in using the designs. Um, I try and keep myself in a good headspace. And that, that's how I go about making these, these pieces. As far as obtaining the materials for my art, I, I use big sheets of art glass. Um, I buy big sheets of art glass from a company up in Portland called Bullseye Glass. And we go with them for a number of reasons, but they're environmentally responsible. Um, they're in the United States, so I know my sources for, for the glass. And also the glass is compatible with each other. So I would love to use recycled glass, but unfortunately, if you mix glass from different sources, it doesn't cooperate. It will create stress cracks. It will randomly shatter. Um, so I have to use glass that is compatible with itself. And bullseye glass works. It's been tested since the 70s to, to work with itself. And so that's how I get the wide range of different colors. And um, the, the heat process is, like I say, all done in my kiln and I'm sitting next to it right now. So it's, it's pretty, pretty warm. Um, I'm looking at it and it's down now to 1,075 degrees. So it's, of course, not open flame, but it's, it's still radiating some good heat right now. Yeah, the interesting thing about pottery glaze is a lot of it is powdered glass. And so you'll see with glaze, the color that you start with is not necessarily the color you get after firing. So I make my glass in a kiln and it takes me a couple hours to cut the glass and then apply the designs and put it in my kiln. And my kiln is pretty small. It's only 16 inches by 16 inches inside. So I can fit one large piece in there or four small pieces. So I'm gonna show you the kiln because it's right next to me. And so this is the kiln. 
and I have named it Darth Kiln because to me it looks like Darth Vader. And I I have done pottery in the past, but I wasn't very good at it. So I I, I learned about fused glass, and it's the medium that I'm much better at than pottery. So. With my different pieces, I, I do try and invoke different stories. So like with this piece, what I did was create a, a traditional scene from the Klamath River. So our tribe is based on the Klamath River at the, the mouth of the river. Um, my Yurok heritage is at the mouth of the Klamath and Hoopa is upriver of Yurok. And so with this piece, I tried to capture a scene that is on the Klamath River. So I have a, a sturgeon fish here. So the sturgeon are our grandfathers. And then we have a uh, salmon within this river. Now salmon is critical to our tribes. It's our main food source. And what I did was, um, this is a, a rendering of our traditional redwood plank house. So our tribe wasn't nomadic. Um, occasionally there'd be hunting trips and stuff like that, but, but we lived in villages with redwood structures. And so this is a rendering of one of our houses. So on this scene, I just imagined it being on the Klamath with our, our redwood house with an eagle flying over. And then this design on top is called friendship. So, when you're living in a village like that, I mean, you, you've got to have some good friendships over the years. And this design, I always think about it as friendship over time. So it's like the ups and downs that you have in those long-term friendships. Well, the funny thing was, is this weekend I got interviewed by um, California Native News. And I had a piece and she asked what was my favorite piece that I had out on the table. And I, I showed her my favorite piece and it had a story behind it because I had what's called the stairway to heaven design and I had a raven on it. And so the story for me for that one was stairway to heaven is, I mean, that's the translation of the design. It doesn't actually mean stairway to heaven, but it means going to the next plane of existence. It means passing and then moving on. And Raven is a messenger between spirit world and this world. So in that play, I had Raven, who's the messenger back and forth, and I had the stairway to heaven design for, again, passing and going on to, to the next plane. So I do try and match a lot of times the basket designs I'm using, along with some of the animals that I put on the pieces. So even if the story isn't obvious, but I do a lot of times incorporate stories in, in my pieces is like this piece is a little one. And this one is definitely more basket reminiscent as I, I chose the gold color because most of our baskets are, are made with uh, bear grass. And then the black is made with maidenhair fern. And so I was trying to capture some of the colors of our basket with the color of this one and then being round. And then with the pieces, I have three different levels of it because for our baskets, you have three different levels of the baskets. It's like you have your, your childhood, your maturity, and then your elder years. And so I was, I put three different pieces in this. So in the middle, I have the dichroic shiny glass and it's like your, your birth, it's golden. And then you start to get a little bit older and there's all kinds of things going on. And this one is called crab foot. And then as you get older, um, that design, I've learned it as frog hand. Some people also call it frog foot. Some people call it mountain and some people call it pheasant tail, but I learned it as frog hand. And for us, frogs are our singers. And so wherever you have a healthy river, you have singing and life and abundance. And so I hope in my elder years <laughs> that I have a lot of singing and life and abundance. So I, I do incorporate things. They're not obvious, but I, I do try and tell different stories with my pieces. Um, recently, 
we, I said we got accepted to the Santa Fe Indian market and I submitted a fused glass mask that I called singing a song of healing. And that mask, um, it was multi-level inspiration. So on that mask, I have the red handprints for missing and murdered indigenous women. Um, I also made it a mask because of COVID and we incorporated our traditional beadwork into the mask is on our regalia we wear a lot of abalone and dentillion and there's bear grass and pine nuts and other natural things that we put in our regalia and when the women wear the regalia and they dance their regalia sings and so the dancer is dancing and the regalia is singing and we wear a lot of our regalia during ceremonies that are to bring about healing. And so I created that mask, incorporating our regalia to sing for healing for both COVID and also the missing and murdered indigenous women. Thank you so much, Karina. You know, it really, is a good way to round us out and bring all of the elements of story and symbolism and tradition and and history together um, into the modern expression of the world, especially with the problem still with missing and murdered Indian women. So are there any more questions? Um, yeah. Kat, I'll go ahead and read a question from Kathy Harvey. She, uh, she says, such beautiful pieces from everyone. Thank you so much for sharing. I was wondering what kind of challenges any of the artists have experienced in making or selling their pieces. So I guess any artist who has an answer to that question, if you want to unmute yourself and jump in, we'd love to hear from you. Marie? Yeah. Or Rowan? Um, oh, well, Rowan, or Rowan? Rowan, okay. Let's do Rowan first yeah, and then maybe Marie. There's, there's, there's always challenges to selling your work, marketing your work. Um, you know, for me, um, I think because my work is, there's traditional elements to it, but there's also, it has a contemporary feel to it too as well. So I think, you know, I'm able to kind of cross cultures in, in a sort of, um, in a sort of way, um, you know, selling work is, is kind of, you know, it can have challenging aspects to it, um, especially when, you know, if you're doing pottery, if you're doing clay work, I think I find out that it takes kind of a special, that special person to, to come to the booth um, and to gravitate and to have a connection to a certain piece. Um, and that doesn't happen all the time. Um, again, it takes, you know, all those, I guess, all those vibes, that energy, you know, has to be there in order to sell the work. But when it happens, it does happen. Um, you know, some, I find some shows are successful for me like um, the Santa Fe Indian Art Market, that's a very successful show for me. And some shows aren't as successful. So yeah, there's always a lot of parameters when selling your work, um, whether it be online, whether it be at Native American art shows or non-Native American art shows in general, you know, the, where you're showing, what city you're showing, uh, what community you're showing, you know, plays a factor in, into that as well. But um, one thing I learned is, you know, no matter how small, no matter how big the show is, you know, every opportunity is, is an opportunity, you know, <laughs> to show your work, to tell your story, and to reach out to different people um, who are, aren't aware of Native American or Indigenous art. So, yes. Marie. Well, I was over the moon when I got uh, four of my teapots into the Autry gift show. Uh, I thought I'd, I'd gone to heaven, frankly. 
This last uh, couple of years has been kind of hard because everything was kind of shut down here in California. I had to explore online. And fortunately, I'm a, you know, a, a member of the Ventura Potters Guild, and we have an online uh, a uh, little shop online there, and I have a website, and uh, I am going to open an Etsy store at long last. I never did that before because I, I didn't really quite understand how to do it. So I'm really, at, at, in my dotage, I am really learning to do these things. <laughs> it's amazing to me. <laughs> Yes, every opportunity is an opportunity. And being, oh, yeah, being on Facebook helps too because some of the fans from, you know, what I do for a living, acting, some of my fans have begun to collect my pottery from Facebook. And it's very sweet. And we do have a Nesh Kanukit uh, Facebook page. Yes. And, and that, as Whip Woman, I try to encourage artists to send me news of their exhibits and and their how to contact them and 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 uh, obtain their work. So I'm I'm happy to learn about Kosai. Is that right, Anna? Is that the right pronunciation? And and Etsy. I'm I'm really proud of you and and California. Uh, native glass and and Rowan, I know your work is also picked up by a, a cosmetics company as their designs on their products. Wow! Yeah, so talk about that a second, okay? Oh, okay. Yeah, glad to. Um, well, um, you know, with with artists, um, especially if you do design work. Um, graphic design or any type of design work, there's always the opportunity to um, get, into, get into commercial markets, um, you know, licensing your work to um, corporations or commercial businesses. Um, and that opportunity came from me um, in 2019. Um, I was doing the Santa Fe Indian Art Market and long story short, um, representatives from a company called Orbe um, came to my booth and um, it wasn't quite, you know, they really didn't introduce themselves as, as representatives from Orbe, but they came to my booth, they looked at my work, they, it, they liked what they saw. Um, the vice president of packaging took some images um, of my work, and then a month later, um, they reached out to me. Um, turns out Orbe is a very high-end um, company based in New York that specializes in um, high-end hair products. Um, so, yeah, and, and it was in every year during the holiday season, they, for the past, I think, three years now, they've been reaching out and working with individual artists to do the packaging design for their holiday gift sets. Um, so I believe the first artist they worked with in 2017 was a Japanese artist in Berkeley who did um, calligraphy. And then 28, well, I think it's 2019. Well, 2019, they were, worked with... Um, some printmakers in Los Angeles. In 2020, um, they worked with me to do the design work for their um, holiday gift sets, which, you know, turned out to be a really big endeavor for me. It was wonderful um, working with them. And it, it was just a great collaboration experience on my part. I learned a lot um, and I, I, over time, I've gotten a lot of, great feedback, you know, not only from people within the organization, but people outside of the organization who, who, who have bought the gift sets. And, you know, with each gift set, there's a little story under the lid of each gift set of who the artist is and, you know, the story behind it. So, you know, it, it was just a wonderful 
it's it's wonderful to get opportunities like that and um and it just was a great experience for me so thank you any other questions or how are we doing yeah, um, I think we're doing pretty great, Kat. I actually had one other question for Rowan. Um, I wanted to ask him about um, incorporating sort of more non-traditional materials. There was that picture of the um, form with the nails in it. So I wanted to see if you could talk just a minute about that, and then we'll see if any other questions. If anybody else has other questions, please put them in the chat. We'd love to have you have a chance to ask the artists that are here. So um, maybe if we can have Rowan talk about that we'll put up that piece real quick. And Rowan, if you could share just a little bit about your using of those non-traditional materials. Yeah, um, well, I'm a, I'm a big art fan and I, I really find the most interesting part of the American art movement was the abstract expressionists and the whole New York school of, in the early 20th century. Um, and this school kind of progressed and produced a lot of great artists um, and, you know, there's a lot of artists who would use found objects in their work, um, Robert Rauschenberg, George Herms. And I really kind of enjoyed that movement of found objects. Um, people who take discarded everyday objects and bring them into a studio and create these wonderful sculptural pieces that have a lot of aesthetic um, applications to them. So I, I started kind of thinking about that with the clay work. Um, so I started thinking, well, what could I use besides non-clay materials to incorporate with, with my pottery work? And here's an example of that. Um, here's an example of combining rusty nails into the clay work. And um, over time, a narrative started to develop with it. So, you know, with our people, Native American people, especially amongst Pueblo people and Navajo people and indigenous people all across the United States, you know, we try, traditionalists try to live in this very natural world, living in accordance to the rhythms of Mother Earth, to their natural environment. It is what, it is those, that natural, rhythms that have sustained their cultural from one generation to the next. And um, another part of that balance is also industrialization, technology. So, you know, these are worlds that inhabit native lands and that kind of um, break up the rhythm of that um, way of living in a very traditional way. So it's kind of, you know, the narrative behind it is the clay represents the natural world, um, Mother Earth, and all the found objects like the nails, sometimes they use um, metal pieces. That's, uh, that represents technology, industrialization. And so those pieces kind of have that balance of those two worlds. And that's the narrative behind using, you know, found objects within my clay work. Thank you, Rowan. Really appreciate that. Um, we don't have any other questions right now in the chat, but I don't know if um, any of the artists want to share anything else that they didn't get a chance to share, any um, stories about their work or things like that. Um, Marie, do you have anything else you'd like to share? Oh, let, oh let's see. I just talk I, so much. <laughs> uh, I have something from my sister. She actually says, so impressive and inspiring to hear all of you speak. I am deeply grateful to all the artists for sharing yourselves in such a profound way. So that's really nice. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, and well, I um, if you can Anna, write, go ahead. Yeah. In, in chat, can you send a link to uh, Kosai? so that we have it up. I know we got the one from for Oribe and we'd love to have a link from you also. Yeah, that'd be great. So, well, thank you so much. We're so appreciative of everyone. You don't see my face because I had an accident and kind of messed up, but we appreciate everyone here um, sharing. And it's, this has been a wonderful, wonderful time together. So um, if there aren't any more 
questions or anything, any parting comments anyone wants to say, I guess we can probably say goodbye. You have anything else you wanted to say, Kat? Yes, I wanted to thank Greenly Art Space for, for working with Nesh Kanukat and providing, this is our second really collaboration and it's it's a wonderful place. I also remind people that it, um, this panel discussion will be up on the Greenly Art Space YouTube channel. And I also wanted to thank the Alliance of California Traditional Arts for um, reaching out to all traditional artists and imagining this kind of collaboration. So uh, I want to thank everyone. Yeah, wonderful, Kat. We, we thank you too. Thank you for moderating our discussion. And I thank each of the artists for taking the time to be here today and to practice and all the people from the audience. We will be having, um, I think as we said in the beginning, a series of panel discussions that are gonna be coming after this. So kind of look out for those are gonna be really great, kind of the same thing with contemporary, traditional and beyond. We're looking at those. And then um, January 22nd, we're gonna have a big art show that will have work from these artists that you heard from today, as well as upcoming artists on gourds, beadwork, basketry, and storytelling. So you won't want to miss those. Um, if you're not already signed up, you can go to our website, greenlyartspace.org, and you can sign up on our mailing list. So um, great. And Kathy Harvey also says, such a wonderful experience. Thank you so much. So thank you guys for um, your encouragement in the chat. And thank you, artists, for taking the time and sharing with us um, your beautiful work. We really appreciate each of you. So all right. I think, Thank are you. we done? Is it a wrap? It's a wrap. All right. Everybody Yay. applaud. Yay. Okay, everybody, you can, uh, you can all unmute yourself and clap if you want. Hooray. Good job, Robin Harrison. Un oh, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, if anybody wants to say hi to anybody else, we can leave it open for a few minutes. If anyone wants to say hi in your language or goodbye in your language. I wanted to say thank you, Kimberly. Thank you so much, Kat. You are a spectacular wet woman. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. touches. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Good job. Wonderful. Okay, let's just wait till everybody signs up.